letting folks in now. Um, if you are in Los Angeles, hoping that you are staying cool. And uh, I'd like to welcome all of you. My name is Juri Candelario. I am the director of APAIT, a division of special service for groups. APAIT aims to advocate, educate, and achieve optimal health and well being for underserved and vulnerable communities. Tonight, APAIT is unveiling a campaign to raise awareness about the importance of mental wellness in the LGBTQI2 spirit community. And this coincides with the commemoration of the mental health awareness during the month of May. And to talk more about our campaign, please welcome my colleague, Senior Clinical Program Manager of APAIT, Jake Weinrup. Jake. Hi, everybody. Um, so we're really excited to be doing uh, this panel as part of a broader conversation during the month of May about mental health and specifically how it impacts our LGBT communities. Um, clients entering the doors of our agency come not just with traumatic experiences in their lives, navigating homelessness, addiction, relationship issues, various types of violence, but also the trauma of growing up as an LGBTQ person. Um, it shapes what our clients discuss in therapy and how they move through the world. Um, now more than ever, as we're coping with co the COVID crisis and finding ourselves more isolated, the need to reach out and access support is quite simply vital. Um, so I wanted to thank our APIT staff who are continuing to provide excellent uh, client care during this crisis, we are staying open as frontline workers and continuing to see people. I know that our communities that we support really appreciate it. Um, and I also want to thank our division director, Jerry Candelario, and our senior manager of strategic partnerships, Jasmine Creighton, for utilizing their relationships uh, within the communities that you know we're a part of to put together this diverse panel. So we're really excited um, for the wisdom. Um, that our panelists bring tonight and hopefully uh, this can give some of our viewers ideas on how to advocate um, for themselves and the importance of reaching out. Um, so one thing we did, a lot of this was inspired by a video that we did with Laverne Cox um, earlier in the year and she actually joined us for a gala at our OC location um, and spoke a little bit about her own experiences. So I wanted to share the video from my screen about, um, about our campaign. I'm sure that now. Laverne, can you tell us about your process seeking mental health services? So I went to the therapist and it turns out I needed therapy. <laughs> um, once I got into therapy, I realized that um, the bullying I experienced as a kid, the emotional abuse, the sexual abuse I had experienced as a child, I hadn't dealt with any of it, that I was in denial about all of it, and that it was affecting me. I thought that I had, I had this elaborate cover, I had to like everything was fine, and that I knew everything because I was smart and I thought I was cute, and I was in so much pain that I, didn't even know how to deal with. If it weren't for therapy, like the success that has come to me, I would have sabotaged it. Like the, this is the thing, there are blessings I think that the universe has for us. And if we have not done th the work to be able to receive those blessings, I believe we'll sabotage them. And so therapy has been crucial for me to be able to feel worthy to receive the blessings that the universe has for me. My quest for wellness starts with me. Awesome, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. yeah. So without further ado, I'm gonna introduce our facilitator, James Q. Simmons. James is a board certified nurse practitioner, on-air medical expert, and doctoral candidate at UCLA. He also holds a bachelor's of science in broadcast journalism, a master's degree, a master's of science in nursing, uh, he has extensive multimedia hosting experience and 10 years of hospital-based critical care experience. It's also National Nurses Week, and James is a proud member of the most trusted profession in America, 18 years running. James has curated the online social media health community, Ask the NP Everything You Are Too Scared to Ask Your MD, 
this is a safe space on social media where the LGBTQ community can get real, relatable, and reliable information to empower their health. James is currently guest co-host of the nationally syndicated talk radio program, Drop the Subject, heard in more than 36 US markets on the largest LGBTQ radio network, Channel Q. So that's Joey James. Thank you very much. Wow. Um, who is this James guy? So uh, listen, it's my, it's my uh, pleasure and honor to, to be able to moderate this panel. And I just sort of, for everyone who is here, uh, our guests that I'm going to introduce here in a moment, and everyone that's watching, and Jake, who's worked so hard, and Jury, and APAIT, everyone. I just, I like to level set. I like to sort of unify everybody here. So everybody just take a big, deep breath in. <sighs> take that breath out. Good. We're all here in the same space. This is a safe space, and it's, I think it's really unique that we're doing something like this virtually. But I also think it's really important too to just sort of level set and say that we are in crazy unprecedented times right now. We're gonna talk a lot about that. And there's probably going to be some technical issues. <laughs> and we're probably gonna do that thing where we talk over each other because someone's internet is a little bit delayed and all of those things are going on. So I just ask for everyone's patience because we're gonna talk about patience with yourself. And, and patients with starting your own mental health and mental wellness journey. And so you can start practicing that here, bringing that patience to uh, this situation. And so far, everything is going really well. And I can't thank uh, our guests and our panel enough for being here, but even more importantly, everyone who's watching right now and everyone who's, who's tune, tuned in. So with that said, I have some bios to get to, and I am very, very excited about this. So as you can see on the screen right now, we are so blessed and honored to have Laverne Cox, who is a three-time Emmy-nominated actress, Emmy-winning producer, and a prominent equal rights advocate and public speaker. Laverne's groundbreaking role of Sophia Bursette in the critically acclaimed Netflix original series, Orange is the New Black, brought her to the attention of diverse audiences all over the world. This role led to Laverne becoming the first openly transgender actress to be nominated for a primetime acting Emmy, let that sink in, and made her the first trans woman of color to have a leading role on a mainstream scripted television series. An artist, an advocate with an empowering message of moving beyond gender expectations to live more authentically, Laverne is the first openly transgender person to appear, get ready, on the covers of Time Magazine, British Vogue, Cosmo, and Essence, among many other magazines. She was named one of Glamour's Magazine's 2014 Women of the Year. She also proudly holds two SAG Awards, winning them with her Orange is the New Black castmates for outstanding performance by an ensemble in a comedy series. Other accolades include a Critics' Choice nomination for Best Supporting Actress and consecutive NAACP Image Award nominations for Outstanding Supporting Actress in a Comedy Series. Laverne, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Woo. <laughs> that made me excited. I'm just, I'm all very excited, by the way. Um, so next on our panel, as you can see here, we have, oh, Miss Margaret Cho, which I do have to say, by the way, I, I had an opportunity to meet Margaret when I was a wee gay, when I was uh, 20 years old and had snuck into a bar in Chicago and you were performing and I got to see you and meet you and say hello. And you, I know you don't remember this because you've you have met a trillion people in your life, uh, but you were so gracious and wonderful and lovely and hysterical, of course. So I just, and you made an impression on my life as a baby gay in Chicago at, at 20 years old, illegally in the bar. So thank you for that, Margaret. Thank you. Um, so Margaret Cho is a five-time Grammy and Emmy-nominated comedian who was named one of Rolling Stone Magazine's 50 best stand-up comics of all time and one of CNN's 50 people who changed American comedy. From her groundbreaking TV show, All American Girl, to her off-Broadway one-woman show, I'm the One That I Want, love it. The Cho Show, Sex in the City, Drop Dead Diva, my favorite. Dancing with the Stars, All About Sex, and Highland Margaret Cho has been one of the most exciting, unpredictable stand-up comics and actors working in Hollywood today. And given our social climate, Let's just be real. The Asian American female comedian's voice has become more valuable than ever. Cho's material remains compelling and thought provoking because not in spite of her unapologetic delivery. And with so much success in her artistic life, Margaret has never turned away from the causes that are important to her. She is an incredibly active person with anti-racism, anti-bullying, 
advocating for the homeless and gay rights campaigns, and has been recognized for her unwavering dedication by the Asian Excellence Awards, the ACLU, NOW, GLAAD, American Women in Radio and Television, the Lambda Legal Defense and Education Fund, the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force, the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund, PFLAG, and LA Pride, who gave Margaret a Lifetime Achievement Award for leaving a lasting imprint on the LGBTQ community. Margaret, we thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you. So also, of course, on the screen, you can see Council Member Mitch O'Farrell. Mitch O'Farrell has served as Council Member of the 13th District since July of 2013. That's here in Los Angeles, by the way, for those of you, we got a global audience. Uh, Mitch is passionate about safe neighborhoods and has overseen the production of more than 1,000 units of affordable housing in the 13th district since he took office. We're going to talk about this later on, how important that is to our community housing. He is reforming city policy to help small neighborhood serving businesses and collaborating with the entertainment industry to make sure we can grow our signature industry and the good paying jobs that come with it. Council Member O'Farrell, as one of two openly gay, openly LGBTQ members of the LA City Council has been on the cutting edge of the LGBTQ progress in the city. Collaborating with the Transgender Advisory Council, Housing and Community Investment Department, the Human Relations Commission, and the Personnel Department, Council Member O'Farrell was instrumental in crafting the first citywide transgender sensitivity training for staff at LA City Hall making Los Angeles the largest municipality to require. <laughs> Additionally, Council Member O'Farrell, in partnership with the Salvadoran Education and Leadership Fund and Equality California, led a delegation to Tijuana, Mexico, to provide outreach and services to LGBTQ plus asylum seekers waiting for entry into the United States. Council Member O'Farrell, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks, James. It's good to be here. Absolutely. And then um, Valerie Spencer is joining us um, in a, a little while, and I'm gonna introduce Valerie when Valerie joins. Um, and right now, we, I'm gonna introduce uh, uh, Robert Malon, who has over 10 years of nonprofit organizing experience serving various communities within Los Angeles County. He's previously served as president of the Asian Pacific Islander Pride Council, was the Neutrogena United Way campaign chair and president of Barangay Los Angeles, a community organization serving the LGBTQ, Filipino, and Filipino American community. He is currently serving as the advisory board chair for APAIT. He is a quality systems and compliance manager for Johnson & Johnson and leads the Neutrogena Open and Out Employee Resource Group. Robert holds a BS in chemical engineering. Robert, thank you for joining us. You, you can wave and smile because you're muted. There's Miss Valerie. Welcome, Miss Valerie. Uh, <laughs> that's all, always making an entrance, of course. I love it. Um, so Valerie Spencer, who just popped up on your screen, everyone, has worked in the arena of social services, focusing on health disparities as it relates to transgender persons and others within LGBTQ plus communities for more than two decades. That's 20 years, y'all. That's a lot of work. The directive she gives herself is very simple, to make the complex comprehensible. She is a behavior health therapist at APAIT in Los Angeles and curator of Holistic Empowerment Institute, an organization which centers on empowerment on a social, cultural, and spiritual basis for LGBTQ plus communities. Valerie is a national speaker for Merck Pharmaceuticals and holds a master's degree in social work from Cal State Long Beach. She is preparing to pursue doctoral studies in holistic psychology. And in 2019, Valerie became Reverend Valerie Spencer, an ordained interfaith minister from One Spirit Interfaith Seminary, stating, I have created myself into the holistic mental health practitioner and healer I have always wanted to be. This is the vision for my life. What an incredible statement to have as we begin talking about mental health and mental wellness tonight. Welcome, Ms. Valerie. <laughs> Everybody, this is a lot of power. Everyone is muted except for me, I think. <laughs> this is great. This is great. I get to say whatever I want. So basically how this, how this is going to go for everyone watching and everyone on the panel, I have some scripted questions. You know how this goes. We got to do a few scripted questions because I want to give everybody a chance to sort of talk and really listen. We are incredibly honored to have this group of people all together at the same time in one place. So we want to hear from some folks. So I've got some scripted questions. We're going to kind of go through those and then we're going to open up Q&A. 
And so I see that there are quite a few people in the chat already. We're gonna open up for some more questions and chat later on. So first the scripted questions and I'll kind of bounce back and forth between our panel and then we'll open up those scripted questions. At that point, it's a little bit of a free for all. So people may be asking questions specifically of Laverne or Margaret or council member O'Farrell or whoever, um, where I got my cute glasses from recently, like whatever the questions are, we will, we will take those on at that point, okay? And again, thank you all for breathing, level setting, and understanding we're here to discuss as members of the LGBTQ plus community, our mental health and mental wellness journey. So question number one is for Laverne and Margaret. Um, and this is just kind of a, a, a general question, but I think one that's really important because starting a journey with mental health and mental wellness is sometimes the most challenging aspect, just getting going on that journey. So kind of a two-parter, where, where did you start and how did you know that it was time that you needed to sort of put some attention and focus onto your mental health and your mental wellness? Laverne, how about we start with you? Hello, thank you so much, James, and thank you everyone um, for, for being here and everyone out there who's watching. I'm insanely grateful to be here. Um, I alluded to in the, um, in, in the video that my, um, I started therapy, oh my God, it would be 20 years ago. I went into therapy and the reason I didn't actually want to start therapy, the reason is I had been, I started my medical transition um, with a Dr. Weinberg in New York and he did not require therapy for me to start my um, hormone treatment in um, 1998 <laughs> it was. And, um, and then he retired. And then I went to the Calumore Community Health Center in New York City and they continued me on my, um, existing regimen, but they said, you have to do therapy. That is just our protocol. And I said, I don't need therapy. I'm, you know, I'm fabulous. And I, you know, I, you know, I know intersectional feminism and I'm really smart and cute. So I, I don't need therapy, but I went to the therapist and then I had to go for a certain amount of time as I continued to go um, to maintain access to my, um, to my um, hormones. I realized I actually did need therapy. As I alluded to in the video, I had all of this childhood trauma that I had not dealt with, um, sexual abuse, physical abuse, um, bullying, just really, really intense stuff, traumas that I just had pushed down. And um, so I didn't really want, I didn't sort of choose to go into therapy, but once I started the process, I realized that I needed it and I continued. And um, 20 years later, I still, I've been doing video therapy <laughs> during quarantine every week. And it's actually hard to make it to my therapist every week because I'm always on the road. So the good thing about quarantine is every single week I have had video chat therapy with my therapist. So I'm um, 20 years later, I'm still in therapy and um, it has helped so much and I'll shut up and let Margaret talk, but I have so much <laughs> more to say, but um, yeah, 20 years later, I'm so grateful that uh, Callan Lord said, you have to do this because <laughs> I wouldn't have gone on my own. Very good. And I think that's really insightful that sometimes whether, whatever your spiritual beliefs are, whether it's God or the universe, or even if you don't have any spiritual beliefs at all, sometimes it is an, it is an outside force that sort of motivates us motivates us if you will towards what towards the beginning that journey and we might not even know that we need it but something else really uh, incites that so thank you for sharing i have i have more questions about that too we'll get to those so margaret just you know as kind of a reminder a refresher like what what are, when did you know it was sort of time to start your journey to to mental health mental wellness and how did that start for you well in my family that we have a long history of alcoholism and abuse and mental illness and suicide and you know it's something that has hasn't ever been addressed until my generation and um so you know because immigrants at least until you know like people my uh, in my age group they like they're like oh we don't need help we don't get help like we don't do that that's like what white people do you know, and so it's like we didn't seek it and we just lived with these problems and just covered them up and didn't do anything about it. And um, and so, you know, like the, the, um, that the that sort of like going to get therapy and things like that, that was like look at, looked at as this privilege that we couldn't afford. So like later, like when I could finally figure out like that I could do it, it was this amazing thing. And, you know, I was really... Um, 
lucky to be able to get it. I mean, mine, mine really came out of realizing I had to, because I was self-medicating through mm -hmm. alcoholism, through drug addiction, because it's like when you don't have um, anything in place to try to figure out what's wrong, it's like, you're going to try to make yourself feel better through drinking, through um, whatever you can at hand. And um, so for me, it was really about like trying to figure that out. And like, you know, going into show business, like I had, like, there was like, you know, the success that I had, and there's certainly like, there was stuff that I could go to that made sense. And, um, you know, like I, I had attained this level where I could sort of manage it. And then, um, you know, I love a drama. So I love to get like, put away for a time. Mm. So I really like kind of was like, like really had sort of like to crash and burn for a while to really learn a lesson in like, it doesn't have to be so dramatic. It doesn't have to be so crazy. So now I sort of have like a now an understanding that depression and loneliness and all of that is really symptomatic to a kind of thing that like we can deal with it. It's not like a shameful thing to have depression. It's not a shameful thing to have mental illness that is like something that is um, you can manage day to day that you can deal with. Mental illness is something that everybody has some degree of. It's almost like we're not broken we are all like human and it's actually like okay and it's actually something that we can come to with a sense of like oh all right i can manage this i can deal with this and keep on going and so therapy is a part of my life but it's also something that i keep returning to um i'll like move away from it and come back to it um but it's like a it's more, more more like a holistic system as opposed to like, I don't get put away in a hospital anymore for a year and a half here, year and a half there. It's pretty good. Yeah. Well, and I, I love what you just talked about there in terms of I, the word spectrum came to mind that, mm -hmm. that it, there, there are not the haves and the have nots when it comes to mental health and mental wellness. It's not, Oh, these people who have depression and anxiety or, or and the intersection of those issues with drugs and alcohol, and these people don't. We, mm -hmm. we all do, we're all managing that. It's just on different levels and it's just on at different times in our lives and different ways that we're coping in different situations. And I think that's so, I, I love that you said that. And I, I think it's so critically important right now in, I've been calling it Miss Pandemia. During Miss Pandemia, when she is like running our lives right now that like, Miss Pandemia, it's hard when she's in charge and the rest of us aren't, and we're not in charge. And that is really moving people along that mental health, mental wellness spectrum so much. Um, so thank you for sharing that very much. I wanna get back to later on about your um, sort of holistic approach to this very much so. Um, so, but I do wanna give Council Member Mitchell Farrell a chance to talk here. Um, and again, thank you so much for being here. So I, I brought up, the obvious, right? The, the elephant in the room that everyone is talking about, right? That elephant is not hiding. Uh, but this COVID-19, this pandemic that's really hurting all of us. And, you know, as, as an elected official, as an, a member of the LGBTQ plus community, um, you're, you know, representing a, a very, very diverse district um, mm -hmm. in a huge, very diverse city. What are you seeing as, as someone who's representative of individuals in that district as sort of the top concerns that, that are coming forward about mental health and mental wellness for your, I guess, constituents are the, are the right word. What are, you, what are you hearing from folks? What are they tell, talk to, talking to you about? Yeah, yeah, thanks. A great question uh, and wonderful conversation so far. My mind is just swirling. Um, you know, uh, before COVID-19, before Miss Pandemia arrived, <laughs> had serious issues. I mean, the homelessness crisis is, is uh, it, it really is a humanitarian crisis, and it has been way before COVID-19 ever hit anyway. And it's a public health crisis. And I think what the epidemic has done is, or the pandemic, is it's brought it home uh, to roost. And, and it has laid bare all of the weaknesses in our healthcare system and everything else. When I say healthcare, I talk um, mental and physical well-being, um, and so really, what we've done is just focused even more on getting shelters up and running, getting services, 
uh, in a ro more robust manner um, laid out. Taking advantage of this project room key with the transfer of the hotels uh, and housing people who are experiencing homelessness in hotels. Um, just yesterday on the council, we've been having all these emergency meetings that go anywhere from you know five to twelve hours marathon meetings. Uh, yesterday we landed on a, a an ordinance that will um, require and really focus on any hotel that's ever received a public subsidy to force their hand into housing people who are homeless during the pandemic because they've re received a public subsidy and the public needs them. And the public is people experiencing homelessness. So it's been a real focus, uh, just stepped up. Um, and we've, we've brought up uh, emergency shelters that are in our now shut down recreation centers and gymnasiums and everything else with a full-time nurse and mental health professionals on site, uh, fully staffed. So it's really kind of um, brought the best out in folks and it's focused in uh, all of the, the weaknesses in our social service system at the same time. And I just have to give a shout out to APAIT. We've been working with them for years now and we uh, got the midnight stroll up and running. We fund that and, and, and that, uh, that program is, is helping house um, transgendered individuals who are experiencing homelessness as well. So we're focused on not leaving anyone behind in this pandemic. Um, and so housing and shelter, definitely ramping it up as never before. We wanna sustain that. I think that one of the benefits once the pandemic begins easing is it's forced us to look at this crisis in an all new way. And the irony here is that just today, the state of California announced it has a $50 billion deficit, 50 billion. And I've spent a lot of time in Sacramento this year lobbying for $1.2 billion to, to match what we're doing in LA for homelessness. Well, now they've got a $50 billion deficit. So we have some challenges, but we can overcome them, especially if our focus is fresh and new, a bit of a reset. And we can't let go of that after we start easing into the whatever the new normal will be once the pandemic eases. That's my focus. Keep people housed and fed and let's keep people on a, a solid footing um, well after the pandemic begins to ease. And, and, and that's the perspective that drives all of my decision making. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And, and Valerie, I'm, I'm coming in to you next, but I... I think that sometimes it is just quite simply that getting that very fundamental rudimentary level of food, water, shelter before you even have an opportunity to focus on your mental health and your mental wellness. And I, I think so many of us understand that because of the work that, that I've been privy to, to help be a part of and, and witness and, and help a little bit with, with APAIT and other work that I've done, and I see it in the hospital, I, I see it as a, as a nurse practitioner, but you know, I, I, this conversation about, you really level set us there, because this conversation about mental health and mental wellness can't go anywhere if you are experiencing homelessness, if you are, are having a significant you know, deficit in care, and significant deficit in food, um, and, and basic items like that. So thank you for your work. Um, for the for the community that is taking advantage of that and really pushing um, the the you know others in Los Angeles to really help us with that because that's where this journey has to start. So thank you. And I kind of just wanted to to it seems to make sense in the flow of the conversation, um, Reverend Spencer. That uh, you know I sort of wanted to hear from you also. What are you sort of hearing from individuals now during the pandemic? Um, in terms of, of mental health and in terms of not only wellness, but mental health and what types of uh, specific issues are, are individuals coming up with. I, I tend to not, you know, I'll be vulnerable a little bit myself. I tend not to be an anxious person at all. Um, that is something that I have, I have lots of people in my life who, who, who deal with anxiety a lot. And it's something that I've had a really hard time understanding because I tend to be quite the opposite of that for whatever reason. In, until now. And, you know, we, we left the house the other day just to go on a drive, a 
legally approved drive in the county of Los Angeles, by the way, we were just going for a drive. And I, I was so, I was a wreck. I was sweating. I was super nervous about leaving the house. I thought I left the stove on. I had like four masks in the car. I had all of these things. And it was, it's different when I drive to work, but then when we left to do something, and, and this is a kind of a new experience for me. And so what it got me thinking about was what are, what are some of sort of the other things that we're finding individuals are experiencing now and during, you know, coronavirus. Well, hi, everybody. Um, and hi to my beautiful baby sister, Harvard. <laughs> so, I love you. Love you too, sister. First of all, I just want to lift up and agree with the council member that it is my pleasure and privilege to be uh, an employee at APIT. I work with a group of young people in the OC office and in the LA office who are extremely client centered and client focused and even uh, put themselves at risk, often mindlessly putting themselves at risk so that they can be fully present to the clients that we serve. Because yes, indeed, our clients do uh, live with homelessness, live with HIV, live with substance use. Uh, and so those issues must be addressed. But I do want to just lift up and perhaps disagree a little bit that even in the presence of homelessness, and food insecurity, wellness can be a choice even in the presence of those things. Beautiful. Right. Wellness can be a choice in the presence of those things. And so I hear from my clients who, like myself, have been terrified. Uh, many, particularly transgender folks who have not fully been let into the halls of academia and employment, are still having to do survival sex work and commercial sex work, even in the presence of a global pandemic. Mm -hmm. And for trans people, uh, it's a new phenomenon that we actually get to be people who are concerned about our well-being. We've sort of been historically thrown out to whatever winds may be and left to survive uh, if we survive through whatever means that we can. And so my number one uh, offering to people is to first stop, and I'm gonna ask us to practice that now, just to stop and take a breath. Mm -hmm. It's free, it won't cost you nothing. Everybody <laughs> right now for with me, take a breath, inhale, and just let it fall. And as you do that, some things will happen in here somatically and in here and perhaps even in the gut, right? And so even though chaos may be swirling, we can choose to be stable. We can choose to take our meds. We can choose to take a breath. We can choose to hug a friend. We can't touch a friend perhaps, but we can make some choices even in the presence of those things. And for me personally, uh, I've been sheltered in place for a good month before the outbreak hit because I'm a caregiver for my mom mm -hmm. and I needed to step away for a moment. Uh, and then once it did hit, I found myself living in a state of terror, in a state of terror so much that I have rashes on my hands from washing with hot water and bleach. And I've been tested twice for COVID because my breathing and my doctor said to me, you are so scared that you have created some COVID symptoms even though you don't even have COVID. I've been tested twice. Mm -hmm. And so very recently I decided that I'm a healer, God damn it. Mm -hmm. Amen. <laughs> I'm a healer Amen. and I will take my power back. I come from Crenshaw and Florence. So COVID's just going to have to get in line. And right. so I've told my clients, I've told my community, I've told myself and those that I love that we must find ways to operate with a level of safety, but we have to operate with a level of sanity. And of course, consider our wellness and our well-being because it is a choice that we can exercise. And so I am seeing clients via this little square tube that we see uh, and, and offering them some tools uh, as to what wellness might look like for them. I, I want to hear about- Preach, preach. 
Thank you. Preach, Reverend. Preach. I love you so much. Thank you for that. That's my sister. <laughs> I mean, this is, I feel like I, I just, full disclosure, I feel like I needed to hear, hear that a little bit. Um, because I'm certainly not from um, Crenshaw and Florence, but I, I am from my hood where I grew up. And I feel like sometimes I need to find a little bit of that too and be like, no, Miss, Miss Pandemia, you're not in charge, I am. And this is how I'm gonna approach this. Uh, and so thank you for that. It was a little bit of a pep talk. I hope everyone else listening as well got a little bit of a, of a pep talk from that, Valerie, thank you. You, you brought up a, a beautiful segue into kind of my next question in particular for, uh, we'll start with Laverne and then Margaret again. The, about about identity and and Laverne you kind of touched on this a little bit your transitioning and need to have hormones and changing from one provider to another kind of forced you into therapy but how did also your identity play a role in that journey that you might have you might have been forced into but then now you're it's still a journey that you is taking place 20 years later and how has that your identity and and issues around that shaped your your journey so far? Mm, I have to say, I'm so emotionally full from everything um, my sister Valerie just shared. And so I, I, so I, just, I am, I'm breathing, I'm breathing, but I want, but so I can, I'm, I'm, I'm just so, in, I'm just been an intense day anyway, but I'm, I've gone through the same journey with this quarantina, I'm calling her quarantina, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> with quarantina, Miss Pandemia, whatever, wherever we were calling her. Uh, I've just, been, it's been a very up and down for me, but now I see it as an opportunity. I really see this as an opportunity for spiritual growth that I must take. I'm less busy than I've been in seven years. So I have, I would be remiss if I did not take this time to be quarantined and less busy and not to prioritize my mental health. So it has become the past week and a half, I would say it's become my number one priority to come out of this situation more spiritually enlightened, more mentally well, more just overall um, better. Um, my identity, when I, when I, when, Questions of identity and mental health come up. I think they're actually really crucial um, to talk about. And I, I'll just get present. Today, I woke up very sort of not able to, I, and I love that Valerie mentioned somatic work because I've been doing somatic therapies now for, um, for almost four years. And um, so much of my work is about the body and, and about healing through the body. And so, I, so I've been working on a, a lot of my resilience tools in the, um, in the um, parlance of the community resiliency model, um, which is all about sort of resetting the nervous system, right? That right now, you know, obviously, you know, our nervous systems were hardwired um, as human beings when we're in a, in a forest and we spot a bear. We are hardwired, our, our bodies release all these chemicals so we can either fight that bear or flee that bear or freeze. And um, we release all these chemicals and hormones, but then like, you know, we flee the bear, we get, we get back to safety and then our bodies go back to sort of homeostasis. We're not designed to be, to be, you know, sort of in that heightened survival state all the time. If the bear is in the house all the time, that's not a healthy place to be in. So I really, sort of my life as a black transgender woman who had just leave my house, particularly lived in New York, but just leaving the house, I had to be constantly on guard. Is somebody going to attack me verbally today? Is someone going to attack me physically today? Growing up being bullied every single day, having to get off the bus and run um, so I wouldn't get beaten up that day. Um, the emotional abuse, all, all of these things, the bear has been very, very present in my life. And so, so much of my work in therapy over the past four years has been about um, somatic work, community resiliency model work, cram to reset my nervous system. And so that is the work, the daily work, right? And so in this morning, when I was having trouble doing that, doing some of the, using some of the tools of the community resiliency model, I was like, what is going on? And um, I got, I was like, well, what are my thoughts? And I've been doing a lot of work with Dr. Joe Dispenza's work, and he does a lot of talks, a lot of Also about recent nurses, he used just a thought can take us into that stress response. 
in being so sort of panicked and worried and what this pandemic has done, just the very thought of getting COVID-19 has sent most of us into a tizzy. Just a thought. I'm sheltered in place. I'm at home. I barely left my apartment in, you know, eight weeks now. And just the thought of it can send my entire nervous system into a tizzy. And all of a sudden, a thought creates that bear in the woods. Mm -hmm. And so I have to get so cognizant of my thoughts. And so this morning I woke up and I was having trouble getting in my resilience zone. So I made a list of every, <laughs> of every thought that I'm having that is keeping me from being in my, in my resilient place. So the shame, shaming thoughts, stories, traumatic things, that thought, just the, the thoughts that are gonna take me out of my resilience, thoughts that are gonna put me in this fight, flight or freeze place. And, that, and, and it's important to note too that, that when we're in that fight, flight or freeze place, chemicals are released in our bodies and those chemicals over time can cause disease, right? We can literally make ourselves sick with our thoughts. And so getting really cognizant about what I'm thinking, what I'm saying to myself about myself. And I've done this work before, but it's been a minute since I've just made a list of all the subconscious thoughts I'm having about myself. And a lot of it is about identity. A lot of it's still internalized transphobia. A lot of it's still internalized racism, internalized classism. I've really been dealing with like my history with internalized classism. But then there's just all these other, there's so many other things on that list. And so getting aware of that, and I was like, Lord Laverne, okay, we have to, re so I made the list and I was like, I have to reality check this. But just even being in the process of making the list and making it conscious, I can begin then to make different decisions decisions about what I'm going to do in the moment of allowing those thoughts to shift my um, body's chemistry, right? So now I've made a list of the things and I'm like, oh, this is, this is all bullshit. This is right. bullshit. This right. is not true. So let's, can I not allow that to act on my nervous system subconsciously anymore? Can I let this stuff go? And so that is the pro that is the work today. And it's a daily process since it's different every single day. So the identity piece is so much of those things for me that I've internalized about myself that I am less than because of blah, 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 blah. And so then there is the work that we must do. Thank you, um, um, council, Councilman, for mentioning all the work that has to be done systemically, right, to make sure that people have access to housing and, and whatnot. So there's the in institutional, the ideological and the interpersonal, but then what I can do to free myself, to take myself out of oppression, because we can oppress ourselves. And I think that even if, even as a black trans woman, yes, I have tons of privilege now, but even before I was on television and on, on magazine covers, I was engaged in this work of, uh, of worthiness. I was engaged in this work of letting, of healing myself through various processes, right? So even, so it's not about, it is certainly a privilege um, to get to work on oneself, but I love that what Valerie said about like, no matter what situation you're in, you can take a breath you can take a moment to look inside and, and create safety for yourself. The last thing I'll say is that I think that when I, when I, so when I, when I was growing up in Mobile, Alabama, single mother, you know, we were on welfare at different points and struggling. Um, I dreamed about being in New York and I dreamed about being famous and, you know, dancing on Broadway and, acting on television, I had trained out in being beautiful and I had these dreams and those dreams kept me alive in Alabama and working towards those dreams. And those dreams changed the chemistry in my body. Those dreams like kept, even in these traumatized situations, those dreams changed my chemistry and, and, and reset my nervous system. So right now in this moment, each of us can dream the dream. We can take, you take our imaginations and our thoughts into places that can reset our nervous system. So even as we're isolated, even as we're in fear and terror, we can make a choice to create the experiences of the lives we want so strongly in our bodies and our nervous systems that they transport us. And when we come out of this pandemic situation, out of quarantine, we're gonna be so gorgeously ready and prepared to accept what the universe has for us, all the blessings, and we're gonna receive them with worthiness and with yes, thank you so much. Mm. I'm a, let, let I'm I'm big a fan in ruminating on silence. So I I just I really do. I really want that to sort of set in. 
this is about starting this campaign to use a marketing term, but of my wellness journey starts with me. And that, I mean, Valerie put, got us all together, wherever you are, you can make a choice for that to start with you. And even if it's just the breath, regardless of your situation that can start with you. Uh, so thank you for taking us there. It is rare that I am moved to silence, Laverne, thank you. <laughs> um, I really I really appreciate that. And, and Margaret, I wanna sort of give you an opportunity as well to reflect on uh, identity in particular uh, and how that has shaped your, your journey. And if you can, I know this might, I'm, I might, I'm throwing you a little bit here, but if you are able to sort of relate that to, you mentioned holistic and sort of this whole picture of, of you know, you were talking about extremes in your mental health journey and mental wellness journey before. Um, but, but now that you're kind of taking a more holistic approach and if how your identity was wrapped up in that, either in the extremes or your movement towards a holistic approach or how that works for you. Well, I think um, I'm just so, I'm so moved by um, Valerie and Laverne. So thank you. That's so wonderful. I think what it is, is that I definitely, I can really relate to feeling all of those feelings that you're expressing and really wanting to create these dreams and, and doing that. And for me, like, I think growing up and not seeing images of Asians on television made me feel very invisible. And so I just like internalized that. And so like, I just felt like, do I even exist? And so the holistic approach is actually wrapping myself up like a mummy, like the invisible man, like Claude Rains in the movie. So it's like, I, my holistic thing is I'm, I'm literally like wrapping myself up like a mummy, like to make uh, myself exist. Mm. And it is that sort of like thing of like, so that others can see me and as a kind of, it's sort of protection, but it's a kind of thing of like this gauzy veil that gives me shape and form in the world. And, and a kind of um, sort of, uh, I think um, it, it's almost as if I, I exist here in a, in a self-creation. So it is like form and structure, but it keeps me together and moving and in motion. So it's like you, you sort of have to create yourself and it's that motivation that keeps you going. So it's like the, for us who like, don't see ourselves in the movies we don't see ourselves out there we don't we don't see ourselves anywhere we have to create ourselves and that's what we're doing and so that we can we can do that for the next generation that comes along which is so beautiful it is thank you very much for that i i love that that sort of imagery of of wrapping yourself and and everything is is even just the imagery of that in terms of a, a, and I'm still holding myself, <laughs> it's, very, it's very comforting. Mm -hmm. uh, it is, as you know, we all sort of, everyone watching and everyone on the panel here sort of think about how our individual identities, um, as, as most folks watching are, are somewhere on the LGBTQ plus spectrum, how that in influences our wellness and, and our, our mental health going forward. Um, so, so thank you for sharing, Margaret. There, um, there have been a lot of parallels that have sort of been drawn between, you know, the the uniqueness of our experience as a as a queer uh, to use that as an umbrella term, um, as a queer community, and our unique situation inside of a very unique situation that is COVID nineteen, um, but obviously our community is is. We're used to pandemics, unfortunately. We're used to epidemics. Um, and whether that is uh, an epidemic of, of, of our brothers and sisters being murdered, um, whether that is a, an epidemic of, uh, I believe it is an epidemic of, of people experiencing homelessness um, at disproportionate rates. Um, but the, the very obvious epidemic that draws health correlations to this is, is HIV AIDS. Um, and you know that's what, what I'm doing my doctoral research in. So I, one of the things that I try to r remind people is don't, don't get it twisted. 
the epidemic didn't end in the 80s or 90s. It's, it's still going on. Um, and it's still, it's why a lot of us are doing the work that we're doing. And so what I do think is really important though for people watching is to kind of understand a little bit about some parallels between the, the epidemic of HIV AIDS in the 80s and 90s and sort of how that parallels to what we're going through as a community now in COVID-19. And um, I know Council Member O'Farrell, you, you sort of have a, a little, some experience in terms of uh, in your role um, in, in Los Angeles, being able to draw some parallels between the, that pandemic slash epidemic um, in the 80s and 90s of HIV AIDS and you know, how that's kind of shaped your view and how you're handling COVID-19 as an elected official now. Yeah, thanks, James. Um, I appreciate that. It, it's interesting. I share a little bit about my personal life as well. Growing up in Oklahoma, and at 14, fully realizing I was gay, this is the 1970s, and realizing I'm in real trouble. I've got a problem. It's 1974. I'm 14 years old. I'm gay in Oklahoma. And here to just be put this into a real cliche. I'm in the back of, of a pickup truck that my father is driving when I have this realization. Mm. Um, and everyone has their own story of when they realized something so impactful. Um, I always knew I was different from the time I was a toddler. Everyone else knew I was different as well because I was treated accordingly. Mm. And anyone in, in our community understands that feeling. Um, it, it's an interesting dynamic. I knew I was very different as did everyone else. And at the same time, I felt very invisible. So it's, I've, I've never quite reconciled those two feelings or experiences, but uh, that has certainly shaped my life. So then uh, the year I turned 21, it's 1981. I'm in Tulsa and I see a news report about gay cancer in, in young men in New York mm. City. So right as the AIDS pandemic was hitting, I moved to Los Angeles at 21. Uh, and almost immediately, I met people who I would find out weeks or months later who were my age, who were dying. So right as I'm coming of age as a young, out gay man, the pandemic hits. And for anyone who's my age or in my age group or maybe a little older, maybe slightly younger, not only did it shape our lives, it really has helped define who we are. And I feel that as an elected official with a voice that I need to elevate that. And people need to understand that uh, there is a whole generation of people like me who didn't feel that they would even make it to 25 years old because everyone around them was either growing ill and passing away by the dozens. So they didn't even have an antibody test, I think until 86 or 87, that was able to be accessed by uh, you know, lots of people. So until I was in my mid late twenties, I kind of thought I was doomed as well, like so many others. So we know what it's like, just to harken back to that time, you know, 35 years ago. Um, we know what it's like to be alive and feeling that we might very likely be doomed to die young. Uh, and that's a very real palpable feeling that um, many of us carry with us. It's helped define who we are. It's helped make me devoted to serving, really. I, it's, it's just helped me in so many ways. I'm convinced that my own life's journey has led to me devoting myself to public service. Mm. I feel extremely blessed, extremely privileged to be alive and well when the vast majority of my contemporaries aren't privileged like I am. So I feel like it's almost like Part of my outlook for public service is speaking for those who didn't get to make it like I did, just being alive. 
And what an incredible privilege that is. I feel so lucky and fortunate. Um, and so for anyone who is frightened, and that's pretty much everyone who's affected by this pandemic, there is a whole generation, a whole universe of people who've been here before. And I think that we can help in some way. Um, one thing that is very interesting also is June, the month of June is LGBT Heritage Month. Mm -hmm. The country, maybe even across the world, but it's the big month long celebration in Los Angeles that I always help co-lead. Well, this year, all of those celebrations and public displays of pride are off the table. So we're going to do, we're going to um, announce this really soon. I'll kind of announce it here, but we don't want June to come and go without the recognition of pride. So we're going to uh, do a call for essays and it's gonna be called Pandemic. I wanna hear from people who lived through the 80s and 90s and relate those experiences to what we're going through now because I think that can be very useful on a large scale. Um, so that's one way of, that we can deal with this further. It's also the 50th year of the very first gay pride parade in the world, which happened in Hollywood that I represent on the LA City Council mm. and on June 28th, 1970. It was the very first. And we're going to dedicate a plaque at that location of McCadden and Hollywood Boulevard happen to represent where the district where so many LGBT history was made, the first different light bookstore, um, the, the location where the Mattachine Society was founded, mm -hmm. first LGBT rights organization in the world, mm -hmm. uh, site of the gay, first LGBT pride, gay pride parade. So again, I have a particular responsibility as the first out gay male representing the district that I do. That's, none of that's lost on me. My own personal and professional experiences, they need to come to bear. I have a responsibility and I'm so lucky and proud to be able to, 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 be able to do that. So that's kind of where, where my head is with all this. It's very meaningful, it's very important. And I think that we can, we can help in some way. And thank yeah. you. May I may I just say may I say what 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 just came up for me as you said that is that a sense of purpose can be so good for our mental health. Having a sense of, of, of being of service in the world and being connected to something that is bigger than us, if we can do it in a way that we don't, you know, deplete ourselves, it can be a wonderful tool for our healing as well. And so I. I it, that, that I think that's important. Not, I don't think we should be of service in a way that we um, don't take care of ourselves first. A lot of us are running around trying to take care of everyone else and we are like, our cup is empty and we're trying to fill up everyone else's cup. But I, I, I think there's something that is so beautiful about being of service that can really align us and, you know, and, and can get us in our resilient zone because that's really so much of, about what my mental health journey is about. And I just wanted to to bring that up because that, that I think that your sense of purpose, council, um, councilman, I think is um, is something we can all um, use on our journey. Yeah, I, I think you nailed it right there. Yeah, it is a sense of purpose, and it we all need that. We all want to feel useful. That's a human need, mm -hmm. and it's what a privilege it is to to understand that and be able to to fulfill that. Amen. Yeah. And I think there's some there's out of that purpose comes this resiliency that you spoke of too. That, that was the, the one that sort of stuck out in my head that, you know, I feel like as a, as a community, if there is anything, and it's a little bit akin to what Valerie was talking about earlier, but like as, as a community, like, listen, they tried to come for us before and we're still here and we're still fighting. And some of that resiliency that we have as a, in our own individual experiences within our greater community, uh, comes from that sense of purpose, right? And it, it's, it's kind of circular and it, it feeds back on itself. Um, so thank, thank you very much for sharing that. I, I want to, um, you know, in the interest of time, I wanna make sure that we get to some questions because we do have some questions from um, the audience here as well, folks that are writing in. I am gonna ask each of you on the panel though, so get this in your brain, start thinking about it. Kind of a, a parting, um, 
I don't like the word advice, but but sort of a parting, how are you dealing right now? Just like, what are some tips that you are doing right now? You know, Valerie and I have everybody breathe in right now, which I love it and it is great. But but what are just sort of some tips that that everyone can go through, even if you've been sitting on Zoom calls for 12 hours a day or you're out of work or you are you are experiencing homelessness or whatever is going on or you're everything's OK or you have a loved one that died or you're sick yourself. Like just what are some sort of things that you're sort of doing to cope? Um, and I think we'll, we'll sort of kind of um, wrap that part a little bit. But I do want to get to um, a couple of questions here. And part of me while I read through some of these um, questions to see what uh, um, what are some of the best questions that we have from the audience here. I really like this question. I, um, I will, I'll leave names off of this just in case uh, individuals don't want their names um, done here. But uh, there's a question. This one's for Margaret and Laverne. Um, and it's a little bit about kind of what we talked about before, but I'm going to, they have a little twist to it. So they're taking their first step towards therapy. Um, they had a question about finding the right therapist for that. So not just the journey, but the actual therapist, which can be a really critically important question. Um, so Margaret, what was, what was that like for you, like finding that, that right therapist? Um, I think it's really about trusting your instincts, trusting your gut instincts about feeling it out. I've had, a, you know, for me, it was really trial and error in trying to find the right person. Sometimes it takes a little bit of time. Um, but yeah, usually uh, we kind of know instinctually, like it, for me, it was uh, really uh, just listening to my own kind of like feelings about the person. Um, uh, I, I kind of went at it from uh, the 12-step um, programs, kind of helped that, that sort of like going into it from that direction helped me a lot, but there's lots of different ways to go about it. Um, but that's how I sort of got introduced to um, therapy in the first place. So that was a place for me to start. I mean, and also like I actually found um, different ways at it, but the, the sort of, I guess it depends on like where your entry point is, but um, just be open and um, listen with your heart. Awesome. Wow, that's, um, that, that's a hard one. It really is. And I've had over the past 20 years, I've had, multiple therapists. A lot of it was about, at certain points, it was about my insurance. It was about my what my insurance, um, who my insurance would cover. And so I remember there was one period, I was on Medicaid, I was living in New York, and I knew I needed a new therapist. And so I went down the list of who, you know, would take my insurance and, and the little booklet that they gave me. Mm -hmm. And I went to, I went to about five or six different therapists and kind of just auditioned them, if you will. And so I remember, and then there was one therapist, uh, Carolyn, um, and I was with her for probably about five years. And in in what she said to me in that, in the first session, she said, and I, 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 know, I still use this. She said that we are not living in reality when we're ruminating on the past, when we're making positive or negative predictions of the future, and when we're reading people's minds. She said our work is to stay present, curious, and non-judgmental. In the first session, I was like, <laughs> okay, well, okay, okay. I think I need to like look into what this woman is talking about. Right. And it, it, what's so beautiful and brilliant about that um, for me is that, yes, our, our, our stories are important and in in our past and our history and owning that is important. But at the end of the day, like th those, again, those past things can take us out of the moment, can take us out of the present. And I, I just love that. So, um, and the therapist they have now, so that was insurance going down a list and just trying out different people that stuck with me and the therapist I have now actually I am um, my um when I moved to LA I am um, my bosses um at the show that I was um doing they were like oh is that I came to LA kicking and screaming I didn't want to move here <laughs> I was like I'm a New Yorker did that till death now I love LA and they were like oh you know you should come to this barbecue they were having there's a lot of former New Yorkers at who's gonna be at the barbecue and one of the women at the barbecue suggests um, the topic of somatic therapy came up and a doctor of mine at Callan Lord in New York had mentioned somatic therapy for me and I was gonna go to the somatic institute in New York and it just never happened and I was like this is not a coincidence so things keep coming up the universe is probably trying to tell you something so I was like okay somatic therapy the universe is probably trying to tell me something so I reached out to her after the barbecue 
barbecue and I said, you know, which is there a therapist you would suggest? And she, um, that she suggested this woman and she said she might be full, but she may be able to suggest someone who does somatic work. Well, the therapist I'm seeing now, Jennifer Burden, who did have a little space and it's been incredibly transformative. And the work I've been doing with her for the past almost four years has been transformative. So sometimes a recommendation could be great. Um, in your insurance and then it's a try don't be afraid to try out different therapists i think if this if something doesn't feel right if you don't feel safe i think the most important thing is that you have to feel safe in your, in your with your therapist if you don't then you're not going to be able to do the work so listen to your gut with that good i, I like what margaret said about that. i love right you both said the same thing listen to your gut it's very it's very important um Valerie, I think we might need your help a little bit with this one as well, but I'm gonna kind of open this one up to anyone who sort of feels moved to answer this question because it, it's a really important question and I think we sort of sometimes think about mental health and mental wellness on, a, on, on particular levels, right? And we've kind of talked about spectrums as several times here and this, this one gets to my inner fat black gay kid growing up in Nebraska this one gets at that a little bit. And I think it's really important for sort of all of us to kind of provide a perspective about this. So this question is, what advice can you give to younger LGBTQ people who are struggling with substance abuse and depression from bullying and judgment and not feeling wanted in this world for be just being who they are? Well, I want you, I want you, somebody wants you. I want you, I want you to make it, I want you to be well. I want you to be mindful of your power and should you forget, uh, I'd love to work with you and point you in the direction to understand your power. Um, and I'm seeing clients, by the way, and I have a great program I'd like to talk about that in a bit. But you know, I live in California and I must say that we're not going to be able to indica hybrid or sativa our way through this one. <laughs> Sure. The experiment has been done. It failed, right? We're going to have to draw upon ourselves, right? And this is why I am so grateful to be in my 50s. Oh, mm. I'm so grateful to be in my 50s because I could care less what my nails look like. I'm not running out and putting myself at risk because my hair needs to be right. And so if you are struggling with substance use, I just had to be present with that. Um, you. If you are struggling with substance abuse, um, there are some alternatives. Margaret talked about 12 step programs. That was her entry point in the therapy. And so you can certainly go to NACAAA, uh, CLA, all of the A's. And uh, they have always had, and particularly right about now, they have online platforms, call in platforms where you can get the support, addiction, and recovery support that you're seeking. Uh, I am a clinician on a program called Project Reclaim, which addresses trauma as a vehicle to address your substance use. And so we will be having uh, online support groups in that regard, and I'm working with people one-on-one -on -one, uh, with the Project Reclaim program. I am and my colleague, uh, Dr. Sarah Milan, Milian in Orange County will be doing online things to help you uh, both achieve some mental wellness and address your substance use. But you know, deeper than that, so Heather, I did my, I did my do, but beyond that, it is okay to feel your feelings. Mm. It is okay to have feelings. It is an appropriate response right now to be fearful, to be cautious, to be terrified even. That is appropriate. However, I'm inviting you to couple that reality with some deeper truths, right? So the truth may be that you are in fear, yes, but there's some deeper truths that you have always been resilient. As queer people, you come from the people who created resilience pretty much, right? Uh, you've gotten through the day. It's what, six o'clock, which says you made it through the day, which speaks to the potentiality of you making it through another day. Mm -hmm. So 
the truth that you are in fear, the fact rather that you are in fear is just one fact. There are some others that you might want to group that with, right? That you are beautiful despite anyone having told you or not telling you so. That is the truth. So that fear that you are feeling does not need to be alone. And lastly, as notice that I'm making a distinction between the truth and some facts. There are some very qualified, able-bodied, academic people who have the, the facts well taken care of. They know the stats and the figures of COVID, how many people have died today, the treatments, the new diagnoses. They have the facts all covered. I'm inviting you to step into the realm of the truth. And the truth is that you have some feelings, but the truth is also that you are powerful and brilliant and beautiful and resourceful and you have some great resources available to you is another truth that you might want to partner that with and then take a leap and actually do something about it. As for me personally, I have given myself permission to having some of my innocent but decadent treats. I'm sponsored by Bywater, and I have that delivered to the front door daily, if possible. I'm redecorating both my office and my bedroom because I want to be comfortable if I have to be sequestered like this. Mm -hmm. So, you know, allow yourself a few pleasures, pleasures that may not take you out of yourself. And here's something that I will tell you personally, even with my boss on the line. I gave myself permission to be clear of head and not high. Because after trying being numb for a couple of days, I discovered I'm still in terror. Right? Not, right. It's, not, it's helping. not gonna do it, it's not gonna solve it. So if I am sober, maybe I will have some energies and some additional resources that I can utilize to navigate my life, right? And suddenly I find myself remembering who the heck I was. Mm -hmm. And so I invite you to do that. And I'm here. You can reach me, by the way, uh, at Valerie S at APAT online uh, dot org and uh, allow us to support you. Allow us to support you. Thank you very much, Ms. Valerie. I appreciate that. The uh, next question, I'm actually going to send this one back over to uh, Margaret. Um, the, the person asking this question is very specifically asking for your thoughts about this, Margaret. Um, what suggestions, advice do you have for LGBTQ plus Asian Pacific Islander individuals who are uncomfortable expressing their sexuality in public and now have to take their racial identity into consideration? It's kind of it's a, a really scary time. You know, this is upsetting to me too. Um, right now is such a weird time in terms of the uh, weird blame that seems to be occurring around Asian Americans and COVID-19. Like, at, it's like we already sort of bear the brunt of otherness in terms of like, um, it, you know, like in Americanness, for some reason, Asians always sort of like are left out on the table. <laughs> it's such a weird thing. And so I am very, I have a hard time with this. And also with queerness too. That That's, that's another thing, like, um, and and in 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 queerness too. Like, my parents are very cool with like gay people, and they're very cool with like lesbians and gays. Bisexuals do not have a place in my parents' like understanding of what gay is. Like, they're really Ooh. cool with like trans. They're cool with like gays. They're cool with lesbians, but bisexuals, they're like. Well, no, 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 that's like to them, they're like, we don't get that part. And like gender fluid, they like don't get that part. Like they're so binary in their thinking. Mm. It's such a weird, like, I don't know. It's like, that, like my existence is like very hard for them to understand. So I totally like, sometimes Asian families don't connect with certain aspects of the queer community, certain aspects of our identity. Um, it's something that I think is hard to explain, but it's something that I'm continually trying to translate. Um, 
But yeah, it's something that like, it's an area that I'm continually trying to explain and translate to myself. Maybe there's stuff that I'm trying to break down in my own identity. I'm not sure, but yes, it's a continual mystery. And, and on top of this, right, like you talked about this blame, this crazy blame that's going on right now and, and hate attacks towards it, yeah. all, all Asians, which by the way, we, we, that is sort of a thing in and of itself that we just lump, you know, half of the population of the world into one term and just call everyone Asian. But Asian Americans who are being attacked and blamed for COVID-19 and then at that intersection of queerness and LGBTQ, um, and then, you know, like experiences like you talked about it, it's, it is a, a unique experience. And I, I, there's not one answer for this right now, unfortunately, you know, yeah. there, there really very isn't. Strange. It is very strange. Council member O'Farrell, I know that um, you are also uh, of Native American heritage. Is that correct? That's right. Um, and so how did you just kind of the last sort of question here from the audience, if you will, how is that they're asking, how has mental health played a role in shaping In the community of America. Whoa. Thank you. I love the question because I led the charge on the city council. And you know what we did? We eliminated Columbus Day in the city of Los Angeles. And we replaced it with, through that, through that experience, I really, it really helped me find myself. Uh, my mother was, a, it was, my parents are both past, but uh, and grandfather, Native Americans. I belonged to chief of the tribe on two occasions, as was his brother. And I later learned, because I had my chief come out and swear me into, into office in 2013, mm. I'm from a long, long line of chiefs. I have uh, was minimized growing up, even though my mother was an Indian princess at 15. She was raised in the tradition. We weren't. My, my siblings and I weren't. And I, I so regret that. But through this experience, again, being on the city council, being the first, the first city council member in, in the city's history that is a member of a federally re recognized Native American tribe, I'm the only one. So that's another area of responsibility that I took on. And I had never even thought about it running for the seat. I was just the public servant guy, you know, who, <clears throat> and I worked on the staff of my predecessor. But I knew that my tribe was important to me. So I, I asked them to write a letter to support me when I was running for the seat, and they did. And then I thought, wait a second, I need to be sworn in at the LA River, which is the ancestral Tongva land where, where the Tongva tribe lived for thousands of years. Uh, so that kind of brought it home for me as well. Then I get on the council and I realize that Columbus Day is on the city's administrative code. Mm -hmm. Not only that, but there was a statue, the key word being was, Amen. A statue at Grand Park across the street. And I thought, okay, I'm on this city council for a reason. I got to get rid of the statue and I got to change the day. So through a two year process, we did all that, work, working with the county to remove the statue. And I found uh, a whole new voice that I never even knew I had through that process. So uh, Native Americans have all of the highest percentages of all of the elements that affect society. You name it, diabetes, um, infant mortality, murdered and missing women, uh, the list goes on and on and on. That's what 500 years of genocide will do. Mm. And, and that's really the story of Native America and colonization. And none of that's lost on me. They also, in the county of Los Angeles, um, it's something off the charts of, of um, diagnosed uh, mental health issues, uh, high, clinical depression in the Native American community in the county of Los Angeles, higher than any other demographic. Mm. There's so much healing that needs to take place. 
Um, and so that's something else that I'm really super focused on with our Native American City and County Commission. We work very closely with them as well. And we're trying to elevate the Native American voice in the city of Los Angeles. And just that symbolic act of removing Columbus Day, replacing it with Indigenous Peoples Day, and instilling some pride officially, right, on the ancestral Tongva land where City Hall itself is built, mm -hmm. means something. It's powerful. And when the city takes action, other cities and even whole entire states have followed after we took action. I knew it was important to be the largest population to take that action because it would send a signal and it would reverberate and, and it has indeed. And, and to, to Margaret's point about this bizarre, and your point too, James, about blaming uh, one identity in times of panic, like the pandemic that we're facing. So Asians are the scapegoats. Mm -hmm. I think the LGBT community understands is scapegoating. We understand that well. We, we see it a mile away, we see it coming. And we have to rise up against that. And that's, that is exactly what this is all about. And it's coming from the White House and reverberating through our country in that way. And that has to change. We all have a responsibility to make sure that that does change. And we have to speak up and speak out against it. It's scapegoating, that's all it is. Uh, and it's misplaced blame and it all comes out of fear. Very much so. Thank you. Thank you for that work. You, you used the word just, just this, uh, this taking down of this statue and just this changing it to Indigenous Peoples Day. And I just, I would, as someone who's really moved by this, I don't ever use that word again. That was not just, that was really Thanks. powerful. That was, that was pretty, pretty intense. Um, I know we are um, getting very close to time here. And so, um, and I, for, for the audience watching, I, uh, it is, sort of my responsibility to uh, keep us moving and keep us on time. And so the questions that didn't get answered, that, uh, that is on me. And, but that's because I feel like we were having such incredible conversation here and so much was provided and I really wanted everyone to have an opportunity to share. And I, I learned so much from everyone here um, that I, I didn't, I wasn't feeling like cutting people off or saying, you know, we have to move on to this next question. That's kind of not how I facilitate conversations. So hopefully, even if your specific question didn't get answered, you were still able to learn something. You were still able to sort of uh, uh, explore a little bit about yourself and hear from everyone on here and all of their expertise in their experiences and their identities and their suggestions and, and every way that we've really done to work to kick off this, this health and wellness journey in the middle of this pandemic as a as a queer family. Um, so with that being said, I do want to reintroduce um, Rob. Rob, if you are still you are still there, you're hiding under my question here. Um, and so uh, Rob just uh, is going to talk a little bit about um, APAIT and fundraising, I believe. Sure. Um, thanks, James. Um, on behalf of the entire um, APIT board, um, just a couple of thank you. I want to thank our panelists for such diverse uh, thoughts and opinions and I learned a lot. The breathing exercise really helped me. Um, I see a lot of people in our community who tries to help and sometimes we forget ourselves and I think that was a pleasant reminder for myself. Um, I want to thank James for being an excellent um, moderator. For the APIT staff who put this all together, thank you for all that you do every day. And to our audience, our community, thank you so much for continuing to support APIT for being for reaching out in terms of the different resources that they have. As you all know, APA relies on donors to keep its programming, like the Zoom panel discussions that we have, our residential housing for our clients, our mental health services, also our HIV services. I know it's hard for a lot of people right now, but if you're able to, please consider donating to APIT by visiting their website at www.apitonline.org. Again, thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, Rob. Really, really appreciate that. And I Where are my Neutrogena wipes, Rob? <laughs> I'll get it to you. <laughs> I need your address. <laughs> right, right, right. 
Um, you know, this is this is just the the sort of the kickoff of this experience. By the way, this is this is the beginning about talking about our wellness journey. And I just I everyone is I I have so I li was literally like taking notes on my notebook here, and and there's so much to take away from this. And I hopefully gave you guys an opportunity to think about this um, be before we go. But I I would just love love to hear from um, Councilman O'Farrell and Margaret and Laverne and Valerie. Um, we have exactly uh, 97 and a half seconds to pull this off, but just sort of a, I know, right? <laughs> but just a, that last thought, like what, what do you want to leave people watching with in terms of their mental health and, and, and their wellness and their taking care of themselves as a queer family now in, in, um, during COVID-19? And Margaret, I'm going to put you on the spot first. Gratitude, gratitude, gratitude. Love it. And puppies to cuddle. <laughs> They're the best. Council member O'Farrell. Um, I jotted this down. This discussion motivated me. An outgrowth of struggle and personal difficulty can help you find your purpose. Excellent. Miss, Miss Valerie. So don't be stingy with yourself. Take a breath a good breath and allow that breath to do its job, to reoxygenate, to relax. Be mindful that the breath is the first thing and the very last thing that you will do in the living experience. It can reorder you, right? And couple that breath with an outreach for support. And when you do, we're here to support you. Mm. Perfect, thank you, Ms. Valerie. Laverne. On a daily basis, I am, the most important thing for me is to slow myself down so that I can track what's going on in my body. I can be aware of what's going on, acknowledge it, um, and not necessarily be ruled by it if it doesn't feel comfortable. Gratitude is crucial for me. And then I think both and. If I'm feeling anxious, if I'm feeling fear, there is something else that is also true in my body. And I can sense specifically where that is in my body and I can lean into that and I can amplify that. And so right now, it's so important for me to amplify what is positive and what feels good in my body and in my environment and amplifying that. So that volume can be turned up so high that even if the anxiety is still there, even if the fear is still there, it's, it's just there. But the volume of, the, of, of what's good, of what feels great, of gratitude, of the beautiful future I'm creating for myself, that volume is so much higher. It drowns out all of the other unpleasant. Mm. Again, I, I like a little bit of silence just to ruminate. Can you tell I grew up in the church? We took lots of moments of silence. Um, so thank you all of you um, for uh, allowing me to sort of navigate all of this through this conversation. Um, Laverne, Rob, Valerie, Mitch, Margaret, Jake and Jury, I see you guys there too. The APAIT yes. staff, volunteers, everyone, thank you so much. Everyone who's watching, um, please visit apaitonline.org for more information, like Ms. Valerie said, about accessing our behavioral health and housing services. And listen, if you are at that crisis point, even if you don't think you're at that crisis point, but, but something's going on and you don't know where to reach out to, you are a phone call or a text away. You can, it's called the National Suicide Hotline, but they're there to help for a lot of things. 1-800-273-TALK. That's it. The Trans Lifeline is at translifeline.org. If you are a youth, the Trevor Project is 866-488-7386. All three of those services have text and chat functions available as well. So even if you don't feel like talking to somebody, you can text them or chat with them. If you need help, reach out. We are here for you. Thank you, everybody, so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.